story time. In late September 1962, my three friends and I, all hailing from Chicago, were on our way back to the Twin Lakes cottage our parents had rented for the month. We had just returned from a visit to Grand Haven, where we'd gone to witness the grand opening of a musical fountain. The drive had taken us about two hours, and at this point, we were roughly 15 minutes away from reaching Twin Lakes. We were navigating along Dewey Lake Street, a bumpy gravel road that meandered between a swamp on the eastern side of Dewey Lake Road. As we slowed down on this narrow, winding gravel path, our car's headlights suddenly illuminated something that caught our attention. My friend, Randy Imes, pointed out what appeared to be a colossal tree right in the middle of the road. The sight was quite perplexing. Our driver, Terry Jones, decided to stop the car, unsure of how to proceed. It was at this moment that the tree did something wholly unexpected, it turned around to face us. Terry later described the creature as towering over us, standing directly in our path. Then, in a remarkably nonchalant manner, it started walking over towards the swamp on the north side of Dewey Lake Road and vanished into the darkness. The girls in the car with us were screaming loudly, and they didn't stop until we were almost back at the cottage. Jones recalled, I was genuinely worried about how to get past that thing, so I didn't stop. But I distinctly remember seeing it walk away into the swamp, disappearing into the darkness. Randy Imes added, I really wanted to go back the next day in daylight, but I have to admit I was frightened at the thought of returning to that road if that thing showed up again. Years later, I did go back with friends while on vacation. The road had been paved by then, but that didn't make a difference. That place was eerie even in broad daylight. Story 3, on a Sunday night in late September of 1962, I was one of five children playing in Glenwood, Michigan. We had just finished watching our favorite television shows and gathered together, searching for a fabled Luna Moth. It was around 9 p.m., and we were about to disperse and head home, preparing for school the next day. That's when Jamie Shaw suddenly darted across Dewey Lake Street in pursuit of what he assumed were fireflies. His friend Mark tried to warn him, shouting, those aren't fireflies, especially not at this time of year. Nevertheless, Jamie was undeterred and continued chasing the distant embers into the swamp. The rest of us continued playing for a while, but soon, Katie Keene's mother began calling for her to come home. That's when we realized Jamie hadn't returned. I remember asking, where's Jamie? But nobody had any idea. He hadn't come back from his firefly hunt. Initially, we weren't too alarmed, but as time passed and Jamie failed to reappear, we started to worry. We searched and called for him but found nothing. We eventually notified Mrs. Howie and Mrs. Shaw about the situation. Soon, the entire neighborhood came together, and we began searching the area with flashlights. Just as Harry Woods, a local resident, was about to call the police, we made a startling discovery. Jamie was found curled up in a weedy area beside the swamp, crying. Katie Keene remembered, we were terrified, not knowing what had happened. We thought he might have been attacked or injured. Jamie later recounted a harrowing story to his parents. He claimed that he had been assaulted by a massive, hairy figure that had knocked him to the ground and tossed him across the street. In the days that followed, Jamie didn't attend school for three days. When he finally returned, he shared the story of the attack with his classmates. The school principal later contacted Jamie's father to discuss the injuries on Jamie's back, which the principal believed were related to the incident from the previous Sunday night, the same story Jamie had conveyed to them. Jamie's teacher, Miss Sally, initially doubted his account. However, during a recess conversation where Jamie remained convinced that he had been attacked by something that had physically thrown him, Miss Sally stated, I'm astonished he wasn't killed. His injuries were severe. I am a park ranger named John, and was driving down a remote road deep within the forest. I reached a point where the Mullica River ran parallel to the road. Up ahead, 
My headlights illuminated a large, dark figure emerging from the woods and making its way onto the roadway. Approaching cautiously, I saw the figure step right in front of my car, blocking my path. I had to bring my vehicle to a sudden halt to avoid hitting this enigmatic creature. The creature before me was something out of the ordinary. It stood well over six feet tall, its body covered in wet, matted black fur. Strangely, it appeared to lack forelegs but boasted a pair of massive, powerful hind legs. As I sat there, the creature's two piercing red eyes locked onto me through the car's windshield. It lingered for a few tense moments before abruptly turning and continuing its journey across the road, walking upright with a peculiar, almost robotic-like gait, eerily reminiscent of a human. Was this a dog man? On the evening of Wednesday, October 31, 1962, I found myself aboard the evening train departing from Detroit, Michigan, making my way back home to Chicago, Illinois. The train had already encountered delays, and as we approached the DAO and KI, it came to an unexpected halt at the remote Dewey Lake Street crossing in Glenwood, Michigan. We remained stationary for around 15 minutes, apparently due to the need to inspect the tracks for debris. During this pause, I gazed out of the window to the northwest into the dark surroundings. It was then that I had a surreal encounter. In the distance, emerging from the dense woods that enveloped the area and approaching the tracks, I saw what appeared to be a faceless tree or a giant stump. The mysterious figure stood there motionless, leering at the train for several minutes. Intrigued and somewhat perturbed, I beckoned the attention of two fellow passengers, Emily Clark from Chicago and Roger Wentworth from St. Louis. To my relief, they also observed the enigmatic sight. After a brief moment, the figure began to move from the tree line toward the train's caboose, which sat shrouded in darkness on the rural tracks. Our consensus was that this figure stood at an astonishing 10 feet tall and weighed between 700 to 1,000 pounds. Soon, the figure disappeared into the obscurity of the night, moving towards the rear of the train. We decided to call a porter, but before we could do much, the train resumed its journey, accompanied by a loud metallic impact that resonated from the rear of the train. We assumed this was the consequence of the train restarting its journey on these rural tracks. The journey continued without any further peculiar incidents, and we eventually reached Chicago. However, upon arriving at Union Station in Chicago, Departing passengers noticed a significant dent in the end car of the train. I felt compelled to report what I had witnessed, enlisting the support of my fellow witnesses, Emily Clark and Roger Wentworth. We took our account to the Chicago Police Department, CPD. To help the CPD comprehend my encounter better, they assigned a sketch artist to create a detailed rendering based on my description. This sketch is now known as the Garcone train sighting sketch and is widely recognized as the most accurate representation of the creature. Regrettably, despite our efforts, the case was dismissed and referred to other authorities outside of the department. The 1960s were a tumultuous era in Chicago, and the CPD seemed disinclined to invest much time or attention into what they considered a minor matter. They recommended that I file a report with the respective city, county, or state authorities since the incident took place outside of their jurisdiction. They expressed their overwhelming burden with actual crimes and the impracticality of engaging in an investigation related to a supposed monster sighting in Michigan. Consequently, the case was never subjected to further examination. My mother just told me that a few days ago, on her way to work at 5 a.m., she saw red eye shine in the corner of her eye from her headlights. She tried to look at what had caused it, but what she saw made her shiver. The creature was about my father's height, which is six feet or more, and had turned towards the cornfield after looking at my mother's vehicle from the side of the road. As she passed it, all she could see was the back end. She described it as a naked man with dark gray or black wolf-like hair, with no tail. After she passed it, 
She kept watching it and saw it turn its head to look at her, but it did not turn its body, unlike how a Bigfoot would. Its body remained still. She said she saw incredible intelligence but also felt an evil presence. A few months prior, on my way home from work at 11.30 p.m., I saw red eyes shine, and then a large creature sped across the road about 3,000 to 4,000 yards in front of me. It had black fur, a long muzzle with a large head, broad shoulders with what seemed like a mane around it, large and long front and back legs at a strange angle, and no tail. When it happened, the first thing that came to my mind was an impossible mix between a wolf and a wild boar. At the time, I didn't know about the dog man, but after learning about it, that's what I believe that creature had to be. All of these incidents occurred in Morrow County, Ohio. Another sighting happened last week outside of Mount Vernon, Knox County, Ohio, about 35 to 45 miles from our house. This story is going to be lengthy, and I'm not sure if it will be as intriguing and intense for you as it is for me. But to this day, I still get chills and my eyes well up when I think about this compilation of events. My tale begins when I was a child, I'm 35 years old now, so this happened over 10 years ago. I was in 7th grade, around 13 years old, and my friend was having a birthday party. He lived about 20 miles outside of town and his property bordered a river to the west, with a road about 1,000 yards east of the river. The house was situated about 100 yards from the river, nestled in a wooded area. There were about 10 of us, skateboarding and just doing what kids do, playing in the river, and so on. I should mention that it was middle September, and I'm located in the northwest of the United States. As it became dark, the kids were still running around, and the family had a motorhome for all the boys to stay in, where they could be loud, watch movies until late in the morning. Around midnight, all the boys were inside the camper, watching Joe Dirt. My closest friend and I, being young and not wanting to hang out with the boys, were still outside with the birthday boy's sister and her friend, playing on the trampoline. We were clearly making noise, playing, and talking. As the night grew later, the girls eventually went inside. My friend and I were just lying on the trampoline, looking out to the east, toward the railroad and the highway. There was a 15-foot streetlight, for lack of a better term, between the trampoline and the house. Beyond the streetlight was a strip of cottonwoods and brush that acted as a windrow at the end of the wheat fields we were gazing at. As we were enjoying the night, something about 70 yards away in the windrow caught our attention. It was massive but moving silently. In fact, everything around us had become eerily silent, the woods, the camper, and us. This thing stepped out, and I was positioned between two trees. It turned its head toward us, making direct eye contact, clearly acknowledging our presence. What we saw were two piercing red eyes atop a deer-like head with antlers protruding. It was incredibly tall at least seven feet when I checked the branch next to it the next day. I've spent years hunting and been in some very sticky situations. I've even had a mountain lion tracking me in the woods, but the only thing I can compare this experience to is the feeling of being prey. In my heart of hearts, I knew there was nothing I could do to protect myself from this entity. The most perplexing part of the entire encounter was that I am a very logical person, and even today, it's challenging for me to understand. I need to stress the situational awareness of what was happening. The streetlight between us and this entity was still illuminated, and yet, this creature was casting a shadow towards the light pole with nothing illuminating it from behind. That was the thought that haunted me for the rest of that night and continues to do so. This entity slipped behind another tree and vanished down the windrow. For at least five minutes after, not a single word was spoken. Finally, I broke the silence and shifted my gaze from the tree line to my buddy, who was still lying next to me, and I managed to fumble out, did you see that? He stammered back with a yes. The rest of that night is quite blurry to me, but we sprinted at full speed to the camper where our friends were. We must have looked pale as ghosts because within minutes, 
The kids were bombarding us with questions about what was wrong. I don't remember what we said, still reeling from what had just happened, but I recall being very adamant about no one, and I mean no one, going out there. To the point where other kids were beginning to get scared. The next morning, I measured where we had seen this being, and it was at least 7 foot 5 tall, even while crouched at the neck. Even then, I was too scared to go to that spot alone. But this isn't where the story ends, it goes on much further. A few years passed, and the friend I had this experience with is now my best friend. We were partying, having a few drinks one night, and this experience came up. We began opening up to each other as close friends do, and I explained to him that I had been plagued by nightmares of this encounter in the past few weeks. His response was far from comforting. He, too, had been experiencing very similar nightmares. In a drunken stupor, we made a pact to call each other the next time we were awakened by these nightmares. Fast forward two weeks, and I wake up, panicked, feeling pursued by this entity. I immediately remember our plan, knowing that my friend is the only person I can talk to about this, so I call him. But he goes straight to voicemail. I hang up, and my phone rings instantly with my friend calling me. He's just had the exact same dream at the exact same time. Here's where the story gets eerie and the reason I haven't shared it until now. I've always had odd things happening to me, supernatural experiences, which I can share another time if you're interested. But at that time, I was 27 and dating a girl in the same town where all of this happened. It was fall, just like when all these other incidents occurred. We were sharing scary stories, and I told her the story I've just shared with you. It was then that I found out what I had seen could be either a windigo or a skinwalker. My girlfriend and I began delving into these stories about skinwalkers, and she was always amazed that when these stories played or had similarities to mine, she could see a physical reaction from me, such as shivers or very noticeable goosebumps. She always said that this was the most believable evidence because it's almost impossible to fake. So, while learning about skinwalkers together, we found lore that says once one has seen you, it doesn't stop looking for you. This idea sent shivers down my spine. Additionally, when you speak of them, they become alerted to your presence, and we had been talking a lot about this. I had to leave for work one night, and I was gone the entire night. Our room was in a basement that faced the backyard, which had a broken fence leading out into a large park. While I was gone, my girlfriend had our window open late at night. She was lying in bed when she heard one of her cats meowing loudly toward the broken fence. It wasn't too weird, but the meowing continued, and instead of coming to the window, it persisted. She grew frustrated and turned on a night light to say something to the cat. As she approached the window, she realized that the cat she heard meowing was sleeping at the foot of the bed. She slammed the window shut, and thankfully, she didn't call for the cat to come inside. She's convinced that it was the same entity attempting to gain access to our house by shape-shifting. This story still haunts me to this day. I fear that by putting it into words, I may open myself to this being and become noticed once more. Please let me know your thoughts on what this creature might be and what I should do, as it seems to come back every couple of years to find me, and it has been a couple of years now. October 2000. It was later in the evening when I was driving back to my in-law's house by myself, and was going down a dirt road. I saw something in the ditch up ahead and on the right, and didn't really know what it was until I got up far enough so that my headlights could catch it. I didn't know anything about dogmen until a couple of years ago. This thing had an outline of a huge dog, but when I got closer, it turned and looked at me. I just floored it. It didn't really bother me until I noticed it looking at me, and I saw that it was actually grasping what it was eating. I got back and didn't say exactly what I saw. I just asked them if they were any big dogs or wolves of where they lived. My father-in-law just laughed and said no. Then he asked why I didn't tell him anything. Though the thing I will never forget are those reddish-orange eyes that just kept staring at me, deep into my soul.
The endless stretch of Wyoming Highway had taken its toll on me. The night seemed to stretch on forever, and the monotonous rhythm of the road hummed through the cab of my truck. I knew I needed a break, a moment to stretch my legs and clear my head. The rest stop ahead, though old and seemingly abandoned, offered a glimmer of respite from the relentless darkness. As I pulled into the rest stop, the dim glow of the few flickering overhead lights revealed the stark desolation of the place. It was as if time had forgotten this desolate corner of the world. Cracked concrete and overgrown weeds marked the once well-maintained parking lot, and the restroom stood as eerie, graffiti-covered monuments to the past. With a sigh, I maneuvered my truck into a parking space near the crumbling restroom building, hoping for a brief reprieve from the road. I shut off the engine and stepped out into the chilly Wyoming night. The air felt crisp against my face as I decided to light a cigarette, the glowing embers casting eerie shadows as they danced in the darkness. It was an ordinary night, at least until I heard it. The noises came from deep within the woods surrounding the rest stop, chilling and unnatural. Strange rustlings, growls, and eerie whispers that seemed to beckon me into the dark. I shook my head, dismissing the sounds as tricks of the night, but they persisted, scratching at the edges of my consciousness. Desperation for a cigarette won over the gnawing unease, and I continued to smoke, determined to ignore the noises. But I couldn't shake the feeling that something lurked out there, just beyond my sight. I had to see what was making those sounds, even if it was just to put my mind at ease. Leaving my nearly finished cigarette behind, I ventured out into the night. The gravel crunched underfoot as I approached the edge of the woods, the trees casting long, ominous shadows in the pale moonlight. My heart raced, and every step felt heavier than the last. And then, I saw them. Glowing eyes in the distance, shimmering like malevolent orbs. At first, I thought they were just the reflections of nocturnal creatures. But as I drew closer, the truth became inescapable. They weren't mere animals, they were werewolves. Standing upright, These creatures were tall and menacing, their bodies covered in dark fur that glistened in the moonlight. They had massive, muscular frames, and their faces were twisted into horrifying snarls, revealing rows of gleaming, razor-sharp teeth. The glow in their eyes seemed to emanate from the depths of their souls. Fear clenched at my heart, and I stumbled backward, my breath quickening. The werewolves had noticed me, and they were moving toward me, growling and snapping their jaws. Panic surged through me as I turned and sprinted back toward my truck. With trembling hands, I fumbled for my keys, praying that the engine would roar to life. The growls grew louder, the thundering footsteps closing in. As the engine roared to life, I slammed my foot on the gas pedal and sped away from the nightmarish creatures that had haunted the rest stop. My heart pounded, and a cold sweat covered me as I glanced in the rearview mirror. The werewolves had vanished into the inky blackness, and I was left to wonder if what I had witnessed was real or merely a product of exhaustion and the dark Wyoming night. As I continued down the desolate highway, the encounter haunted my thoughts. I couldn't shake the feeling that I had crossed paths with something otherworldly, something that defied explanation. Swearing that this was a true story, I knew that I would carry the memories of that fateful night with me for the rest of my life, a chilling reminder of the uncharted terrors that lurked in the shadows of the world. A dog man was spotted in southern Ohio by a close friend of mine at the opposite end of a bridge. It was illuminated by his tail lights and emergency lights. He said he heard a scream resembling that of a woman. When he stopped the car to make sure it wasn't his engine, he saw what appeared to be two eyes reflecting light, similar to a coyote or wildcat, behind him on the bridge. He mentioned that these eyes then elevated by about five or six feet, and a humanoid figure started moving toward him. The creature was hairless but had pointed ears and a snout like a dog, with thin shoulders and gray skin that seemed tightly stretched over its bones. He added that his mind could hardly believe his eyes because he thought he was witnessing a real-life werewolf without any hair. Understandably, he immediately accelerated away from the scene. 
We would greatly appreciate any information you can provide, and if you happen to know an expert in the area, it would be greatly helpful. This incident occurred quite close to our hometown. This all took place a few days ago. Still unsure as to what the F was going on. Anyway, I was sat in my room playing some Xbox when I heard what sounded like a dying animal coming from outside my window. I had heard it a few times earlier that day but this time was much louder and much more aggressive. This of course freaked me out so I went outside to investigate. For context, my window leads to my backyard which is right next to a laneway, separated only by a shitty little fence. I walk outside and head to where my window is to find my dog going buck nutty at the fence, barking and scratching. The strange noise had stopped but I realized that a bunch of other dogs in my street were also going crazy. I initially thought maybe some strays were fighting and one got injured so I stuck my head over the fence to have a look but nothing was there. I calmed my dog down and headed inside into the front window that looks out onto my street. Mine do, this window is quite hard to spot from the street, which makes this next bit extra freaky. The dogs in my street were all still going crazy so I looked out the front window expecting to see some dogs chasing each other or something like that, but all that I saw was a strange looking man walking down the road. His back was turned to me and I stared for a bit, trying to analyze the situation. That's when out of nowhere he turned full 180 and made direct eye contact with me. When his eyes met mine I shit myself and quickly ran from the window. I gathered my thoughts for a second or two and decided to look back out and see if he was still standing there. But nothing. No one. He was gone. The time between me leaving the window to me looking back to see nothing was much too short for him to have left. This whole experience left me quite shook and confused as to what I actually witnessed. Please feel free to comment your thoughts on what happened. Am I crazy or did I genuinely see something non-human? Just so you know I am rather unknowledgeable with this stuff so any ideas or opinions in this event is a massive help. Thanks for reading. I would like to make it clear that this encounter was not with a Yi Naldlishi. However, it involves an indigenous medicine man who claimed to shapeshift into an animal. I share this story in this subreddit in case readers are interested in skinwalker adjacent activities outside of the Navajo Nation, but if this is not the right place I understand as I do not wish to disrespect the Diné culture. When I was living in Mexico in the mid-2000s, I was enrolled in a beginner's Reiki workshop. I was a teenager then, very curious about spiritual practices but also very naive. After one of our sessions, the instructor told me that a native medicine man, who was also a Nawal, shapeshifter, was going to host an event in our city. I begged my mom to take me to meet this man, and she agreed. We arrived to the hotel where the event was taking place, where I was introduced to this man, who called himself Night Jaguar. He was a very normal looking man who appeared to be in his early 50s, and he was very friendly and easy to talk to. I don't remember much of our conversation, but it involved mentioning places where medicine people and witches would gather for ceremonies. Before the conversation ended, he asked if I could provide him with my home address. In my naivete, I gave him my address, and he provided me with his email, so we could keep in touch. I was thrilled with the idea of communicating and possibly learning from a Nawal or medicine man, but I never heard from him again. It seemed like that was the end of it, until weeks later my dad storms into my room and tells me that he forbids me from talking to that damn Nawal again. At this point I had given up on hearing from Night Jaguar, and I didn't understand why my dad would think we had been keeping in touch when we have not. I replied with okay, while wondering what was that all about. A long time had gone by when my dad told me what had led to his imposed moratorium on contacting Night Jaguar. One night, shortly after meeting Night Jaguar and giving him my address, my dad woke up from a deep sleep, feeling quite disturbed. In his own words, he felt as if there was a large and dangerous animal in his bedroom. 
One thing to know about my dad is that he has a keen sixth sense, he can see and feel energies around him, and although he couldn't see what was in the bedroom, he could feel that it was just observing, but more disturbingly, the energy was especially interested in my mom, who was asleep next to my dad. Being unable to go back to sleep, my dad just got up, and told whatever was there that he could feel it and that he knew what it was up to. The activity did not escalate, and left soon after. Since my dad knew about my meeting with Night Jaguar, he deduced that the Nawal was the source of the energy in the bedroom. Fortunately, that energy did not return after that night. After my dad shared about his encounter, I felt immense guilt, as I placed my family in potential danger by foolishly giving our address to a complete stranger, Nawal or not. My family was lucky that the Nawal left us alone after that. I have read and heard about what kind of harm a witch and or a Nawal is capable of inflicting to families for a long period of time. Some people in Mexico believe that shapeshifters can be good or evil, but after my family's encounter, I am weary of trusting anyone who claims to be capable of shape-shifting into an animal. If they are anything like ye she, I wish to stay far away from them. If you made it to the end of the story, thank you for your time. I have been wanting to share this story for a while now. If you have any questions about this encounter, feel free to ask. I live in rural Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and about a half hour from where I work. I can get there going about five different ways. I usually take the most direct path because the other ways take me into Amish country and heavy deer traffic. Plus it's shorter obviously. I pulled out of my driveway and the next thing I remember I was pulling into a gas station in a town almost two half hours and six counties away in the opposite direction. I was literally in a town called Huntingdon, which is northwest of my home. I don't recall leaving the town where I live, driving the interstate, or the sunrise that morning I leave for work at about 5 am. It's still dark. The thing that creeps me out the most is the fact that like I said where I was is well over 100 miles away from my house. What I want to know is how I got there in about an hour and a half. It was just after 6.30 am. I would have had to have driven through the heavy traffic during the morning going well over 70 or 80 miles per hour, at least, plus retain zero memory of it. That freaked me out so bad I called in and told them I wasn't going to be there for health reasons and went to see my doctor that afternoon after returning home. I told the doctor my story, though I knew he didn't believe me. I'm fairly young and Alzheimer's or dementia doesn't run in my family. The doctor did tell me I somehow hypnotized myself, which I don't understand. I brought up the incredible time I reached this destination and the towns I would have had to drive through to get there. He told me to slow down and take some time off of work. But he didn't offer or suggest any help. That was about a year ago, October 2022, and it hasn't happened since. But what really confuses me was the fact that it happened when there were several UFO sightings in the area. I even had relatives claim they saw weird lights in the sky. What are your thoughts? My story is pretty crazy. I live in San Antonio, Texas. One night in June 2021 I heard my dogs going crazy. Three pit bulls barking a lot more than usual. So I step outside. They're looking up towards the sky. I see something flying over my house. Really big. I tripped out. I thought it was a super big owl or something so I went inside and my dog started going crazy again. So I go outside again, with my flashlight, and this time, they're barking towards the dark corner of my backyard. So I'm trying to flash my light over but I can't see anything. I hear movement something really big. I tried throwing a rock over there but nothing. It freaked me out. Finally, after about 30 minutes, the dog stopped barking. So, about a month goes by and I'm in my backyard again, but during the late afternoon. In my yard, I just looked up, gazing at what I heard, a noise up above the trees. I swear I saw something really big, 
like flying by to where the wingspan on this creature had to have been at least 12 feet wide. The strange thing is, that every time it flapped its wings, you could hear a whooshing sound. It was so big I could not believe my eyes. I tried to take a photo on my phone but I could not focus on it. I went online and searched. It wasn't similar to any of the reports posted. Not a pterodactyl, mothman, or thunderbird. The wing shape was bat-like, but strangely different, more like a gargoyle. The color of the creature was grayish, almost steel blue. No feathers, it seemed hairless. The head was small, and no facial features were seen. It made no sound while flying, other than the whooshing when flapping the wings. I recently talked to an ornithologist at the San Antonio Zoo, but he just brushed it off as a misidentification. I asked him if there was anything that big flying around South Texas. He just shrugged his shoulders and said, no. I have written to several people, including a few cryptozoologists, but no one has gotten back to me. That was one of the craziest things that ever happened to me. The year after I graduated from college in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, I witnessed something that I still think about to this day. My friend and I were coming to work. There were three of us on a night shift at the Ontario Research Foundation just west of Toronto. We were coming in at midnight and drove up to the industrial door. Outside the door in front of the little peak windows you have at eye level was this six-foot-ish, black all-black creature. I don't think it saw us approaching and I guess it heard the car, maybe the lights caught its peripheral vision. It turned and looked at us and the eyes were goldish, reflective. There was something about its face that was kind of like cat-like and we were startled. It was obviously startled and, you know, we're looking at each other. We were approaching in the car for a couple of seconds and it just turned and bolted into the woods. This was in 1980. I'm very serious and 100% sure we both saw exactly the same thing. Only one other guy there at the time, and he was in the plant when we saw it and I guess this creature was peeking in, you know, just seeing what's going on in there. But we both told him what we saw and we were just, like I say, very startled ourselves. But I know what I saw and there was something about it that was ape-like in the body although it was all black fur. There was something about the head that was kind of like a cat-like creature, and the way it ran on two legs. It was like a human figure but the speed of the thing when it tore off through the woods was unbelievable. This happened in 2007 in Miami County, Indiana, near Peru, about two miles from Honey Bear Hollow Campground. I worked the night shift and a co-worker and I were both driving down a county road after work, probably around 4.45 a.m., still dark outside. I saw his taillights get brighter like he was hitting his brakes, and then he swerved down into the ditch line, came back out on the road, and kept going. As I approached the same area, I saw this tall, black figure walking on the road. It's moving in a very weird unnatural gait, like it was kind of blowing in the wind, but it clearly wasn't. I first thought it was a really tall person wrapped up in a big black blanket because I didn't see any arms or head, just two big legs and a torso. I had to swerve over to avoid it too, but I basically came to a full stop, and the thing walked past my driver's window. It had to have been around 7 feet tall, as it was leaning forward and was at least a foot taller than the top of my vehicle. As it got behind my vehicle, I could see the taillights illuminating its legs, but couldn't make out any details like hair or anything like clothing. Just large, thick, black legs. I took off down the road once it was behind me and saw that my co-worker pulled into a gravel parking lot, so I pulled up beside him. He's freaking out asking if I saw it, how it didn't have a head, and other ramblings. I said we should go back and try to see what the hell this thing is because it seemed oblivious to us driving right at it. He didn't want to, but he ended up following behind me. We drove back the way we came and in around the same area, there was a large black dog lying across the road. This was not your normal size canine, it was much larger than any normal dog, but it looked dead. 
It wasn't there when we just drove through there less than three or so minutes beforehand. Anyway, I decided I was going to get out and go see if it was alive or not, and move it off to the side of the road because you can't really drive around it without going off the edge of the road on either side because the way it was laying across the road. As I get about 15 feet away, it raises its head up and looks back at me. Its eyes are glowing yellow, but I still say that was due to the vehicle lights causing I shine. It lets out a low, deep, rumbling guttural growl and I stop instantly. It attempts to stand up and seems like it has some sort of issues with its front legs, but it stands up and continues to stand up, on two legs, like a person would. It only stood on its back legs for a second or two, enough time for it to look at me, but then it hunkers back down to what looks like all fours and runs off to the wooded area. But there's a pretty tall fence there so I don't really know how it managed to disappear because it would have had to go over, under, or through the fence, or it just vanished. I also don't think it was using its front legs when it ran off, because I never saw them really moving. Now after all this, there was one last strange happening. My coworker got out of his car after the dog thing ran off, and he came up to me to basically say, WTF was that? As we were talking, I noticed a mouse standing between us. It was also on its hind legs, kind of sitting as it was washing its face. I nudged it with my shoe, and it didn't even seem to care. Kind of like the first thing that was walking, it was completely oblivious to our presence. It just kept on cleaning itself. We left and went our separate ways. I woke up later in the day and started looking into werewolves and came across dogman stories. The only thing I will say about all of that is, that this didn't have the hands and feet like is often claimed by witnesses. It had normal dog paws. It just had a large black wolf style look about itself, but its fur was really fluffy, which didn't really seem to match with the normal wolf type fur. It wasn't a bear, it didn't have mange, I know the difference between a bear and something like that. It just looked like a very large black dog. The first thing we saw, some people said sounded like a Fresno nightcrawler but those were white in appearance, and not nearly as thick and tall. Someone recently asked if maybe it had wings and that's what was concealing its arms and head as if they were draped around the front of it. I never thought about that before, and can't say one way or another because I didn't see any sort of details on its body, just blackness. The way it moved just seemed very odd, otherworldly. I always think of those inflatable tube men that flap around in the wind at car dealers or some sort of events when I try to describe their movements. Just really weird. The mouse, might be the oddest thing to me because I physically touched it, so I know it was real, but it just didn't seem to care. It wasn't until recently I made the connection that all three of the creatures were on two legs at one point. Are they all connected? Who knows? I never saw anything like that ever again, and I only live about 4 miles from where it happened and I drive through that area often. I wish I had more answers but all I get is more questions. As someone who's been pretty skeptical most of my life, I've tried to explain it in some logical manner but I can't. I have said the dog was playing with the mouse, must have got hit and its front legs were hurt, that would explain why it was walking on its back legs and why the movement seemed unnatural. The mouse was traumatized by the dog messing with it, which explains why it looked all wet and why it was cleaning itself. That's the version I accepted for many years. The only problem with that is whatever was originally walking down the road was so much larger than the dog. When the dog stood up it was maybe 6 feet tall, but whatever walked by my window was at least 7 feet leaning forward. The walking torso was also a lot thicker than the dogs, as the legs were very thick, the dogs were normal dog legs. Over 60 years ago I was young living in southern Ohio on a farm my grandmother owned. It was a very rural area, with gravel roads, no plumbing, a well in the backyard, outhouse down the hill. We had chickens in the yard surrounded by cornfields and pasture across the gravel road for dairy cows. One morning I was on the porch alone, and suddenly the chickens and rooster cleared the yard fast. 
Some ran under the house, and some into the cornfield about 20 feet from the house, they disappeared fast and were totally silent. Something scared them. Chickens aren't chickens they will put up a fight with intruders, especially roosters. Something scared the heck out of them. I stayed on the porch looking for what scared them when what looked like a stuffed toy Easter bunny came around the side of the house. Blue with a white tummy, pink in her ears, and button eyes, kind of looked used. It walked as if you were playing with a child and holding a toy from behind, wobbling your hand to make the toy look like it was walking. I could see nothing behind the Easter bunny moving it. I'm staring at it, it's staring at me, it was kind of off-center, leaning towards its left a bit. Little stubby feet and paws like a stuffed animal. Then it started talking without moving its mouth. It wanted me to go with it to play and help it do something, like an adult playing with a child moving the stuffed toy and talking for the toy. It kept trying to get me to go with it around the side of the house. The chickens disappearing so suddenly scared me. The bunny didn't but I've seen these chickens attack stray dogs and snakes in the yard pecking the snakes to death and this bunny was scaring the heck out of them. I probably would have gone with the Easter bunny but didn't because of the chickens reaction. Finally, the bunny was backing away, kind of bouncing like someone was holding it until it was out of sight by the side of the house. I stayed on the porch and swung over the edge of the house to see where the bunny was going. At that time it had turned around and I saw it from behind. I froze. I clearly saw the back of the stuffed bunny-like image but behind it was what looked like a four-legged tiny dinosaur. Its head or snout was stuck into the back of the bunny. It was greenish and had spikes down its back and down its tail. The bunny was probably three feet tall or a bit more to the top of its ears. The little dinosaur was about two to two five feet tall. I ran into the house and told my grandmother. She went outside looking for it and we never found it. My grandmother, born in 1889, told me if anything like that happened again never go with it. I've thought about it over the years and just left it as a mystery. Last fall I went to the UFO Congress and at an experiencers meeting one of the members brought up an experience with the Easter Bunny trying to get him to go with it. He was also from Ohio. Then another guy in the small group spoke up and he had a childhood experience with the Easter Bunny trying to get him to go with it. I recently spoke with a woman who had a similar incident with Santa, when he turned around he had a reptilian tail. I attended the MUFON field investigator boot camp this October and one of the speakers was a retired ranger from the sheriff department on the Navajo Nation. He spoke of several UFO reports he followed up there where people were driving and either stopped or nearly run off the road by giant four-foot rabbits. Only seen when UFO activity was happening. I later asked if could talk to him about my experience, but time was short and he had to leave. I've heard of accounts where beings, spirits, aliens, whatever take on the shape of a character that a child would trust to separate it from family or home for who knows what purpose. I've now spoken with over three dozen people who had a similar experience with the Easter Bunny or other cartoon characters trying to lure them away as I had. Their experiences were more animated than what I saw, but I saw it from behind and the clear detail of it was exactly what you'd imagine a dinosaur to look like. I've had three major, up-close UFO encounters, one was a craft, the Phoenix Lights, two were beings I saw camping in the desert and one included underground digging and a truck chase for my life. Now I'm wondering if I had another encounter as a child. Any insight or thoughts that would be beneficial? Someone shared a 2002 TV movie called Taken that had a depiction of a cartoon squirrel luring a child into its craft. It's on YouTube. My experience was not so animated, but I did see the being from behind the illusion. Let me start by saying I'm a civil engineer, I am a secular person who is agnostic and while I want to understand the universe and all its weird phenomena better, prior to this experience I was extremely skeptical of anything paranormal and believed there to be a scientific explanation for 99.9% .9 of paranormal experiences. However, my wife and I had a shared experience in college that permanently changed my outlook on the paranormal and on spirits or ghosts specifically. 
about seven or eight years ago while back home in Omaha, Nebraska for the summer from college, my wife, girlfriend at the time, and I were bored one night and drove out into the country to stargaze and get some alone time. We decided to take my car and drive out into the country and head north until we found a good dark place to park and chill out. About 10 to 15 miles out of town, I was turning down random gravel roads and found a little cul-de-sac that was facing north, but was newly paved. It looked like someone had constructed a driveway for a house that hadn't been built yet. There were no other houses around for probably a square mile, mostly just farmland. I turned around in the driveway and pointed my car north, and we sat for a few quiet hours, enjoying each other's company and chatting about life plans. At about 2 am we were pretty tired and decided to head home so our parents didn't freak out. As I stated before, we were parked on an empty dead-end concrete driveway, perpendicular to a gravel country road which was about 50 feet in front of us. Behind the gravel road was a cornfield, stereotypical of Nebraska, I know, and it was late July or August so the corn was probably 5 to 6 feet tall, this detail is important. As I go to start my car, I put my key in the ignition, and put my hand on the light switch to turn my headlights on. Before I can turn the key, my girlfriend violently jerks my right arm, which scares the crap out of me. I looked at her confused, but she was just staring out at the road in front of us with a terrified look on her face. Immediately the hairs on the back of my neck stood up and I sat there frozen in fear and confusion. A very tall white human-like figure was seemingly floating from left to right along the gravel road right in front of us. Since it was very dark and we were in the middle of the country, all we could make out was the silhouette, but we both could see it well enough to tell something strange was there. My brain was doing backflips trying to make sense of what I was seeing. From our perspective, the figure looked about 7 to 9 feet tall, taller than the corn stalks behind it and it was moving at an eerily quick speed, faster than walking but not running. There was no gait like a person walking, no head bobbing up and down, no real movement of limbs, it was just floating. My girlfriend described it later that night as a tall, white, gumby-looking silhouette. We watched it for what was probably about 10 seconds but felt like a minute. My hand was still on the knob to turn my headlights on and I had an internal debate on whether or not I should turn them on to better see what it was or to keep them off and not let whatever this thing was to know we were there. It continued drifting to our right until it was out of sight, and I started my car and floored it down the gravel road heading in the opposite direction. My girlfriend and I barely spoke on the way home, and once we got to my parents' house we told them what we saw. My girlfriend left the room while I explained it to them because she was so spooked she didn't want to think about it anymore. She spent the night that night because she didn't want to go home alone, but neither of us was able to fall asleep after what we saw. To this day I am completely mystified by what we saw, and if I didn't have my now wife with me at the time I would think I was hallucinating or going insane. We were both completely sober at the time and neither of us believed in or thought much about paranormal entities at the time. I have not been able to come up with any sort of rational explanation and it still bugs me quite a bit. Nothing makes sense in my head other than some strange amorphous spirit, or a 7 foot tall guy in a yeti costume on a bicycle riding around at 3 am in the middle of nowhere in the pitch black. Do you have any type of explanation for what we saw or seen anything similar on the internet or in person? Let me know. I went camping with some friends near Loch Lomond in Scotland. We set up camp about 3 miles into the woods near a small river and got the fire going to cook some food we brought with us. The site was very remote, but in evening a couple of guys hiked through and stopped to chat, they were from Poland and seemed friendly enough but asked a lot of questions about our group, how many we were etc which left my a bit suspicious but I put it down to different cultures. At about 10 pm I started to feel very ill and thinking it was possibly food poisoning or poorly cooked meat, I never cooked it, decided I would be better getting my fiancé to pick me up. We lived about an hour away by car. 
My friends were all pretty drunk and I had drunk about four or five cans of Budweiser. Stupidly I pack my bag after throwing up hard for 15 minutes and decide to hike back to the main road with light fading. I'm about a mile into the hike back, and at this point I've been sick twice and am completely sobered up by all the throwing up. I've got a sports bottle full of water and stop for a drink to wash my mouth out. At this point it's near pitch black so I go into my bag to get out my torch, small knife and my .22 air gun I brought for snagging a rabbit. As I start zipping my bag back up I hear twigs snap nearby and assume it's a rabbit or a fox. I shine my torch and see nothing but at this point I'm not worried and carry on. Five minutes later I hear what sounds like running maybe 100 yards behind me and a lot of twigs snapping. I turn around assume it's my friends who are messing with me, I call out I know someone is there and I shit you not, see movement in the trees possibly 70 to 80 feet away. It looked like a blue Gore-Tex waterproof, I don't remember any of my mates wearing this color. At this point the sickness is gone, my heart is pounding in my chest, the hair on my neck is standing up and I get this feeling that I can only describe as feeling almost dizzy at the surreal position I'm in. I take off my rucksack and hang at a stump of a tree and kill my torch. I've got my knife in my jacket pocket and I've got the pistol gripped harder than my cock when I was 14. I walk in the darkness for about 100 yards and stop dead behind a tree and wait, I'm trying my hardest to control my breathing which is pretty difficult at this point. Sure enough I hear movement somewhere again, very difficult to pinpoint but it's getting closer. At this point I'm caught in two minds, to continue to hide or to confront. I decide the latter and burst out the bush, flashlight on and weapon ready. I point my torch in the general direction of noise and there are some branches moving. I start moving towards the area like a SAS trooper with my pathetic .22. I hear movement in the distance with a lot of twigs breaking. I don't actually see anything or anyone but at this point even if it is one of my friends I'm shooting the bastard. Silence again and I wait a few minutes and head back for my backpack, it's not hanging over the branch stump anymore, it's on the ground below it and that's probably the scariest part for me because whatever I had been chasing could never have beat me back to my bag, so something or someone else had to move it. The branch was intact as was the strap on the bag so assuming I hung it up correctly which I honestly can't recall, something else was nearby. At this point I tabbed out of there onto the main road pretty sharpish with no incident. My fiancé was waiting at a lodge nearby to pick me up, at which point I was violently sick. I told her about it and she was pretty freaked out. To this day I don't know exactly what happened, if I was trolled by a friend or a fox or whatever, I do know that I absolutely shit myself. I lived about 40 miles in the middle of nowhere Kansas for the first 22 years of my life. It was great. One snowy winter night I was at the house with a girlfriend watching TV in my room, we were the only two there. There was a fresh 6 inches of snow on the ground that was untouched, and it was starting to blizzard again. About two hours into the night there is a sudden, violently loud knocking on my window. I jumped out of my skin, she screams and pull the covers over her head. I grab my phone and call my dad, he is a prankster and figured my mother and him just got home and he wanted to have some fun. I tell him good job, he really scared us. Huh? What are you talking about? We are still in town at Dylan's, and we might have to stay here because of the storm. Oh snap. I grabbed my shotgun and put on my hat that had a built-in headlamp. I open the front door and can't see but 10 foot in front of me. No cars parked in the drive, and no tracks either. I walked slowly around the house, around to where my room was. I saw footprints, fresh footprints that walked from the back of the house, to my window, then back where they came. Shit just got real. I followed them around the house, shotgun shouldered, they curved left and right up the rear step to the back door, back down and around the other side of the house. Then just went off into the darkness headed north. Went back on the house, locked the doors and did teenager stuff. Next morning I followed the faint remains for about a mile to where a dirt road was, where the wind had blown them away. 
never figured out who it was. Last summer I was out in the woods behind my house. I live in a town of 2000 people and the houses are very spread out. Most of the town is woods. Anyway, I was sitting there watching the sunset when I heard a strange noise. Normally it is dead quiet there, besides wind and birds and stuff. I heard a buzzing sound. Then I saw it. A drone. A drone was flying over me. Then it saw me, and stopped, facing me. Just hovering there. Some mega creeper was watching me with his drone. I was really creeped out so I stood up to leave. Yeah, the drone followed me. Who does that? I used to live in my parents' restaurant, situated at an airport for gliders, 15 kilometers from any city. So, basically, it was just us and no one else. As we were not close to the city, we had and still have some unusual exchanges happening here, and sometimes even people coming to have intimate encounters in their cars. I happened to witness that maybe two to three times a year, on the nights when I was still awake, but I think it may have happened more often than I realized. Now, let me share the story. I'll use a heartbeat rate, HBR, to illustrate my personal condition. Normal HBR, aka the chilling state, one night, about 10 years ago when I was still a student, I was coming back from a friend's house between 2 and 3 am in my car. At the time, I was driving an old Mini Mayfair. Both headlights weren't as bright as those of a new car, but it was still a cool car. I entered the parking lot just as I usually did and saw a big man standing between me and my house. I wasn't really scared because, well, I don't know. It's my home, and I'm only about 15 meters away from it. I usually feel safe around here, no matter what. I was more like, is this another strange encounter? So, I went slowly in his direction. As I got closer, my car's light started to reveal that this dude was indeed really big, about 2 meters tall, I'd say. But he was also holding a shotgun. I froze up at that moment. The car was stopped, but the engine was still running. The dude started yelling something and pointed a flashlight at me. All I could think of at that moment was, should I ram into him? I couldn't see anything because of his flashlight. I stayed still and saw the flashlight moving closer to me, stopping in front of my driver's window. He was still talking to me, but my brain unfroze, and I realized he wasn't speaking my language at all. So, I remember slightly rolling down my window and saying pretty loudly, I don't understand. At this moment, two other flashlights appeared out of nowhere. I was starting to feel in trouble. Then, the man at my window turned to his side and pointed his flashlight at his shoulder. That's when I saw it, a G.I.G.N. badge on his jacket. Still bewildered about what was happening, I managed to stammer out that I was living here. One of the other men then told me, in French this time, that the man who had terrified me was a member of the Polish Special Forces. They, along with G.I.G.N., we're conducting a night training in the area because the glider airport is also a state field, so they had the right to do so. Their mission was to secure the area while another group of GIGN and Polish special forces had the mission to infiltrate it during the night. So they let me go, and when I reached my house, I just stayed at the window, with the lights off, of course, and got to witness a real counter-strike action as a reward. The next day, my father told me that G.I.G.N. had come to eat at the restaurant the day before and informed him that they were going to use the restaurant and its surroundings as a training area during the night. As he didn't know I was coming home, he forgot to tell me. From that moment on, my dad made sure to inform me every time, and I even managed to sneak into some of their training sessions. They trained here about one to two times a year at our place, mostly during the night, but also once in broad daylight. On that occasion, the mission was known only to my father and the GIGN one person played a mafia boss, dining at the restaurant and being protected by two large bodyguards. The mission was to arrest them all in the midst of normal customers, which successfully startled everyone. 
My dad thought it would be fun to scare them, as all the customers were regulars or friends of his. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.